So uh, no further ado, I will introduce our first speaker. His name is John Peters, and he will share some uh, exciting examples of, among others, uh, Louis Vuitton, L'Oreal, Dunhill, Lacoste, and there's technology used in fashion, augmented reality fashion. So uh, John used to be in retail and banking, but decided to go into a different direction to tap into the full potential of digital. Uh, he's now director of business development at Volition, which is a company, a creative studio, specializing in emerging technologies, crafting premium 3D digital experiences. So that sounds really interesting, and we're excited to hear all about it. Please welcome John yes. to the stage. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to tell you something about the agency Holition and what we do. We are a creative digital agency. We create stuff like digital champagne, digital makeup, digital nail polish, hologram fashion shows, and so on and so on. Later on, I will elaborate on those uh, topics. First, I tell you a little bit about the history of uh, Holition. The founders of Holition created the, the agency about seven, eight years ago out of frustration. Out of frustration because they worked for the premium luxury brands. And the owners of the premium luxury brands were quite reluctant towards digital. And my, uh, my colleagues thought, what's happening here? The whole world is embracing digital. Why don't our uh, directors uh, embrace digital? Let's bring those worlds together. And that was the starting point of Holition. And the reason why those uh, premium luxury brands didn't embrace digital was that, in their opinion, important things like heritage, history, craftsmanship, provenance, product, the smell of a store, this, uh, the beauty of a store, the smell of the leather, you can't put it in a digital device. And in case you can do it, it would commoditize luxury. And that was bad. And that was not something to look at. And uh, so that was the reason why my uh, colleague thought that that can't be good. We There must be ways how to bring those worlds together. And what actually happened was, uh, the last couple of 10 years, was that digital really disrupt uh, a, lo a lot of things in the world, and es especially it uh, disrupt the retail world. And what happened was that uh, about 10, 15 years ago, brands were only talking at consumers. They told you what to wear, what to like, what to do, etc. And digital really changed that. In those days, it was only one-way communication. But thanks to digital technology, we all have a voice. We have our social media. We have our social network. And we all have a view. And think about the power that um, which uh, bloggers and vloggers have towards brands. And here you see the famous map of Facebook. And this map uh, tells you much more than only where all the Facebook users are in the world. This map is actually telling you that digital technology is able to break through barriers across the world. Barriers regarding age, gender, geography, um, uh, race, religion, and politics. Uh, digital technology really uh, makes it possible that the world comes together more closer and more powerful than there was uh, before digital arrived. And someone who really understood that aspect of two-way communication, thanks to digital uh, technology, was Steve Jobs. And it was at the very heart of everything what Apple did. And it was, uh, and he called it the infinite loop. He actually called also the address of his headquarters of Apple after this idea. And with the idea of the infinite loop, he meant that a connection between a brand and a consumer was so strong that that consumer would automatically buy the next new product of that brand. And we all know the phenomena of, um, of people queuing in front of an Apple store when Apple is about to launch a new product. And in his later years, he slightly modified that idea of the infinite loop. And then it became the feedback loop, the feedback loop where uh, brands are pushing content into the world, where consumers are receiving that content, digesting it, modifying it, and sending it out again to their network. And in the end, it comes back to the brand as new content, which they receive, modify, and send out again. And that goes on and on and on. And 
this is an, an interesting uh, aspect of, of that phenomena of, of feedback uh, loop. This is a fashion show of Burberry a few years ago. And what Burberry is actually telling here is that they are no longer in control of their own fashion show. You see the people in the audience, they are all pointing their uh, digital devices onto the catwalk and they are uh, taking pictures or they are streaming it out to their network. And what happened here was that Burberry, although they are the brand and they are organizing this fashion show, they became a visitor of their own fashion show. Because what they did was, they did exactly the same as the people in the audience. They recorded the whole fashion show on a number of iPhones. This is a, a typical camera dolly, a large installation that uh, normally holds those big uh, TV cameras. But Burberry changed the they became a visitor of their own fashion show. They shot the fashion show with their uh, iPhones and uh, streamed it out into the world. And that's where we are right now. And here you see a limited overview of our product uh, folio. And you see mainly premium luxury brands and quite a lot of cosmetic brands. And, and that's, that's, that's where, where, where we started, uh, to work for premium luxury brands. And I'm going to take you through a part of our portfolio. And there is an evolution in the work we did. Because in the beginning, when we started, the premium luxury brand said, digital, OK, but not in the store. And afterwards, it was, OK, uh, le let's do something digital, but then only close to a store. And the next phase was, OK, let's take digital into a store but only for a limited period. And afterwards it was, uh, the next phase was digital in the store, permanently, but not, in all the but not in all stores. And the next phase will be digital in all stores permanently, but we are definitely not there yet. So here, uh, this is our very first project. Tissot, the Swiss watchmaker, they make watches. They sell them to retailers, and the retailers uh, resell them to the end consumer. But Tiso wanted to establish a direct communication with the end consumer. And they needed a database. And the retailers were quite reluctant to give the data back to Tiso. So we developed this for them. This was an advertising campaign in the UK. People had to buy a magazine. In the magazine, there was an, advert, uh, uh, an ad. They could tear out a paper watch. They had to do the watch around their wrist. They had to go to the regular website of Tiso. They had to fill in their email address gender and date of birth and then they got immediately access at home to 32 different watches at Tissot which they could try on in real time. This campaign lasted two weeks in the UK and after two weeks they had 162,000 new email addresses of people who experienced this at home at the Tissot website. And that they were quite pleased with that and they said what can we do more with this? So we developed the following for them. You just saw the online version. This is what we call the in-store version. This is a campaign at Harrods in London. Harrods had a theme called Swiss Weeks. In every store window, there was another Swiss brand. And in one of the store windows, there was Tissot. There was a promotion team outside that stopped people to pass by. They handed them over those paper watches. And people tried on the digital watch in the store window. But what actually happened was that a lot of those people uh, went into Harrods, they went to the Tissot shop and shop to try on the real watch. We also did this with uh, Selfridges at London, and Selfridges provided us the data of that campaign, and as you can see on this slide, it was quite a, a successful campaign. And Tissot went with this campaign to about 30 cities all over the world, to department stores where they had a Tiss uh, Tissot shop and shop inside. We, we did it for, for Tissot, for Tech Heuer, uh, for uh, for Luminox, but also for this brand. This is called uh, Boucheron. This is Place Vendôme in Paris. It's the traditional old school luxury area of Paris. Boucheron is a jewelry and watches brand. It's that high priced. When you buy a piece of jewelry over there, you get a handsome bodyguard for free. So high priced is it. And this was their way of opening up for the world because it's a store you don't walk in very easily. So they did also the digital try-on in the store window. And we also developed for them a uh, online version where people could try on at home, similar to what we did for Tissot, the expensive jewelry of, um, of Tissot. 
and this was also connected to their e-commerce platform. And please take in mind, this is already six years old. And in those days, we managed to sell jewelry uh, online. And uh, when, I may, when I mean uh, jewelry, in this case, it was Boucheron jewelry. And even rings of 80,000 euros were sold online. It was no problem. And then the very first digital project which um, uh, Louis Vuitton did. And this is an example of, yes, let's try digital, but not in the store. This was in an art gallery. We developed that for them. There was an art gallery in Paris. There was good Wi-Fi. They invited a lot of guests, and they asked the guests to download a special Louis Vuitton app. And as soon as the people uh, had uh, done that, they had to open the app, and there were markers on the floor. And they had to point their device onto those different markers. And then on, their on the screen of their device, a new Louis Vuitton bag popped up, and they could zoom in, they could see the, the details, etc. It looks a little bit like this. This is a video of it. And later on, we, uh, we changed the idea, or uh, we used this idea for a digital fashion show for the brand Hemika. This is, the, this is the idea. Hemika invited a lot of people. They expected a catwalk with models running up and down the catwalk, but there was no model at all. There were only markers on the floor. People had to download the app, and they had a lot of fun uh, with experiencing the new fashion show of Hemika in this way. This is uh, just in our studio in London, but it, but it gives you an idea of how the fashion show looked like. Yes, another project we did for, for Louis Vuitton. It was the first time that Louis Vuitton took digital into a store. This is the pop-up store of Louis Vuitton in Selfridges in London. It's on three floors. It's ground floor, minus one, and plus one. And those three floors are connected by this iconic elevator. And what we developed for them was this, uh, uh, this uh, table. Because we always tell brands when you want to take digital into a store, it's not about having screens in store, it's not about having PCs or tablets in store, it's about enhancing the experience. And seamless should, uh, sorry, and uh, digital should be seamless and invisible. So we always advise to brands, use something which is already there and give it an additional functionality. And in a Louis Vuitton store, there are tables to put products on, to show products on. So, and this is a table, it looks like a table, but when you take a product of Louis Vuitton from the shelf and you put it on the table, then the table opens and the table uh, recognizes the product and it shows you a complementary product that goes with the physical product um, and the table is also asking you questions like, is it for a man or is it for a woman? Is it for leisure or is it for business? And every time when you touch the relevant answer, the uh, the complementary products on the table change. So it's a kind of a sales funnel that helps as well the customer as the sales staff to uh, go through in a logical way through the, the whole product range of Louis Vuitton. There are several reasons why brands get tech wrong in a store. Many times when brands uh, put uh, digital technology in a store, they believe that it... Um, uh, makes the connection between a brand and uh, a consumer stronger. We see a lot of digital innovation in stores in the US and in the UK. But in 80% of those cases, it actually puts a barrier between the brand and a consumer. And there are a few reasons for that. It's the first one is it's very difficult to get people to use technology unless there is this uh, staff member in the store that says to the consumer, dear sir, dear madam, please come over here. Look at this. This might be interesting. Do this and do this and do that. Then people are open to use it. And there's a reason for that. And one of the legacies of Steve Jobs was that he reduced the distance between man and technology by introducing the iPhone. All of us will probably have a smartphone. We download apps, and then we, we, as soon as we have downloaded the app, we open it, we navigate through the app, we make mistakes, we close the app, and we, uh, we try it all over again. There is no app in the world that goes with a manual, but this is how we experience apps. 
That same procedure, you can't do it in a store. There is no customer in the world, or uh, at least not many customers, who want to do it in that way. Because when you do it uh, with a smartphone in your hand, it's in your own comfort zone and it's quite privately. But you don't want to do it in the middle of a store, surrounded by other people, uh, looking at you, how you make mistakes on a large screen. It gives a lot of people the feeling they look like an idiot, and no one wants to look like an idiot. There is another reason why uh, many brands get tech wrong in the store. Tech has got to be beautiful. This is an example of magic mirrors in the world, and there are quite a lot of them who look like this. Uh, you see yourself reflected in a screen, and the technology sticks clothing on top of you. And when you move a little bit, then it looks like this. And imagine when you go to a store and you want to buy a dress or a suit, you put it on, you walk to the mirror, and then you want to look attractive, beautiful, cool, elegant, sexy. Is this attractive? Is this cool? Is this elegant? Is this sexy? I don't think so. So that's where the bar is. Technology should start where the real thing is. And it should start there. That's where the bar is. So we tried to work around with that. And this is one of the very first magic mirrors we did for Triumphs together with the supermodel Helena Christensen. They launched a new uh, lingerie line. It this was in Selfridges. And women could approach this mirror in the middle of Selfridges wearing their regular clothing. The avatar you see, it's the actual body of Helena Christensen. And in this way, uh, women could try on, in a digital way, different uh, sets of lingerie. But this was already six, seven years old. And later on, we, m we did it in this way. Uniqlo came to us. They said, we have an issue with men. Uniqlo is all about colors. And men don't like to put on many times different pieces of clothing in the store. So we solved that for them. They only have to put on one jacket and then the mirror only changes the colors. So this is quite easy. And this goes on and on into all the colors. And we, we develop a gimmick uh, also with it. When someone wears a jacket and approaches the mirror, and he has also a smartphone, suddenly the smartphone uh, starts to buzz. And then you take out your smartphone thinking, hey, who is buzzing me? And then on the screen there's a message. Hi, I'm the Uniqlo Magic Mirror. Can I talk to you? And when you push on yes, then you see a color wheel. And then you can change the colors just like a remote control. We did something similar with shoes for Vans. This is in our studio in London. The real mirror is in a flagship store of Vans in Los Angeles. This is my colleague. He's wearing regular shoes, just like you and me. But when he approaches the mirror, in the mirror, the van shoes are projected onto his real shoes. You so you don't have to to change shoes, because Vans is all about patterns and colors. And in this way, people can try on 140 different uh, patterns and colors of the van shoes. And then we created digital champagne. This was uh, for Moet and Chandon in, uh, in, in the UK. Here you see the famous uh, uh, actor Stanley Tucci. You might know him from The Godfather and The Devil Wears Prada. You also saw Sting. And this is how we played around with the um, uh, magic mirror technology. And everything is can be shared over social media. The last reason, uh, and, and, and that's, th that's a, 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 a something typical from Holitian, uh, too many rely on screens. And actually, we hate screens. There is a reason why you are now all watching at a screen. Because I'm telling something and I'm showing you something. You're sitting here and you, uh, you expect something like that. Please take in mind, for, for those of you who, who have been to the famous uh, Burberry uh, store at Regent Street in London, it's a beautiful store, but as soon as you enter the store, one of the staff members approaches you and asks you to look at something on his iPad. And that's strange. You go to a store to experience the merchandise, to experience the architecture. But why looking down on a screen? That doesn't really make sense. So there have to be ways to work around with that.
I told you before, digital has to be beautiful. And digital enables you to beautify the ordinary. And often when we talk to brands, they, they start the conversation with, we want the most state of the art, the most innovative technology. And we always tell them, why? It's not, about uh, it's not about technology, it's about anthropology, about how humans interact with technology. And we often use old technologies and we give it a digital twist to create beautiful experiences. The next one is a hologram. And holograms are already 150 years old. In the old days, they did it with uh, windows and mirrors. Nowadays, we do it with screens and projectors. What you are going to see is a large fashion show in Shanghai of the brand Alfred Dunhill. Imagine a large conference hall like this. In the middle of the conference hall, there is a stage. On that stage are 64 real models wearing the new collection of Alfred Dunhill. There are 500 people sitting over there and 500 people sitting over there at the other side. When you go to the cinema and you go to a 3D movie, you buy a ticket, they hand you over uh, the dark glasses, you go inside, the movie starts, you put on the dark glasses, and then you experience everything in 3D. The audience here will experience everything in 3D, but no one is wearing uh, the dark glasses, and they uh, w were not um, informed uh, beforehand. What you are going to experience is what we created for Dunhill. They wanted to transfer one of their core values to, chi to China, to Shanghai. One of their core values is Britishness. So we transferred the British seasons to Shanghai. Spring, summer, fall and winter. The actual show lasts 13 minutes. You will experience now a video with a compilation of two minutes. And everything you see, the grass, the trees, etc., is a hologram. This is 10 meters high and 28 meters wide and double-sided. Yeah, and when the show was over, we had to switch off the lights for five seconds because we had to remove the screen, and then the lights went on. And what a lot of people in the audience did, they went, they walked up to the, um, the stage because the models were still there. And of course, a lot of people did it to uh, look at the collection from a close distance, but there were also people who walked up to the stage and were looking like that. They were looking for the flowers and the grass. They just didn't get what happened. And then something else, uh, an old technology with a digital twist, Mona Lisa eyes. When you go to the Louvre and you watch the Mona Lisa, you might have experienced that the Mo Mona Lisa is following, following you, watching at you, wherever you are. And we use that technology in a slightly different way. 
Last year, there was the Ale Alexander McQueen exhibition in uh, London. We, uh, Alexander McQueen, was, it was all about fashion, but Alexander McQueen is also famous for his extravagant makeup. So we created a large imprint of a face, so not a sculpture, but it was carved out. And in that face of the model, we projected the makeup looks of um, Alexander McQueen. But we also projected eyes into that uh, imprint. And the people who watched that, uh, that sculpture had the same experience like people who are in the Louvre and looking at um, the Mona Lisa. And this is in our studio in London. This is an imprint of the face of Alfred uh, Einstein. And you see, it's looking at you. Although my colleague is walking up and down the room. And we did it similar with this one. This is a, a video with that face of the model and the eyes are following you everywhere. But when someone is standing over there and looks at the face which is there and, that same and another person standing over there, everyone thinks, hey, she's looking at me. So this is old technology with a digital twist. And then the last one, mirrors. Can you imagine when you put two mirrors opposite of each other and you put something in between, the image will be infinitized. So this was a project we did for Dom Perignon in London. They built an experience house. And in that ex experience house, we created an infinity room for them. It was a room about five by six meters. It was completely covered with mirrors. And there was content projected on those mirrors. And there was a voice telling you the story of Dom Perignon and there was special music. And when people entered that room and they were surrounded by that content, they, they told us they got the feeling they were sucked into the world of champagne. Yes, then something slightly different. Uh, this is more a, a artistic project than a straightforward retail project. This um, is about the brand List. And List, you can compare it with Uber and Airbnb. Like Uber has no cars and Airbnb owns no real estate, List owns no fashion. They have no stock. It's a kind of a Google search engine for fashion. They are the in-between between brands and consumers. And they are very big in the United States, uh, although they are English. Uh, and last year they had their five-year anniversary. And they had a dinner for their uh, shareholders and some stakeholders and some celebrities. And they came to us and they wanted to show to, their, to, to the audience uh, or during the, uh, during the dinner how powerful, how special, etc. cetera, they, they, uh, they are. And while we were having a chat with them, they told us they had to deal every second with 30,000 mutations in data and inquiries by consumers on their website every second. So that's a lot of big data. So what we did was we grabbed those big data and we, we visualized it. And then it looks like this. And we projected that during the dinner on a large wall with a diameter of five meters. And here you see in real time how the data come into the system and how we visualize this. And the revenue model of List is that they get commission of every transaction. But after we visualized, uh, after that we uh, visualized the data for them, they developed a second model of revenues because they realized they could derive trends from these big data and now they are selling back information out of those big data to the brands who actually provide them the input for that information and they are uh, right now becoming a, um, more a big data company than they are a fashion re uh, reseller the uh, revenues from selling big data back to the brands are already bigger than the revenues from the commission on every transaction. This is my colleague Sandrine. She developed five years ago the world's first digital makeup. This is a proof of concept in our studio in uh, London. Uh, we filmed it and with this video we went to the headquarters of L'Oréal in Paris and Estee Lauder in New York. And five years ago they said, hey guys, very nice, but we're not interested. 
nowadays it's all about uploading pictures and coloring uh, the lips or uh, painting some mascara but for sure not virtual try on in real time thank you but no thank you so we thought okay if the big brands are not interested we leave it but we show uh, we show this video always on conferences and the audience always was quite impressed and asked us hey when will this be launched and we told them well it's not going to be launched because the big brands are not interested until we spoke on a conference in north america someone came up to us and said my boss needs to see this and her boss turned out to be the digital director of l'oreal in north america and at that moment they were looking for an agency who was able to develop real-time virtual try-on of cosmetics uh, for smartphone tablet and pc and we developed that for them but one month before the launch the headquarters of l'oreal in paris told the americans to stop the project because uh, it turned out they did something similar and that was makeup genius you might have heard of it so you can imagine the americans were not amused by their decision we were not amused but hey for us there was no reason to, to complain because they paid us everything and we were not allowed to talk to third parties for over a year so during that year we improved our application and last year we reached out to the brands in the world and we offered them this this is my my other colleague maria and this is actually a b2b solution you won't find it in the app store we provided to brands like a chassis of a car or the engine of a car you know there are several car brands in the world who have the same chassis or the same engine but the cars look completely different and that's what we tell brands we say hey uh, you're interested in virtual try on of makeup how should it look like which additional features uh, should it have etc etc we can develop it for a single brand like covergirl that has been launched a month ago in america or for a multi-brand retailer like Douglas and they will also roll it out here in the Netherlands they already rolled it out in Germany uh, Switzerland and Austria and we added additional features to it and this is one of them imagine you are reading a magazine and you see a picture of a model with a great look and then you think how would that look look on me now we are able to scan it and then that look is projected in real time onto your face and we played around with this application also for last year's um, Alexander McQueen exhibition in London so that the visitors could try on in real time the Alexander McQueen makeup and if someone of you is interested I have my iPad with me and after this speech you can try on the Alexander McQueen makeup onto your own face and and we played around with the English National Opera this is an opera with an Egyptian team and the visitors of the opera could try on um, makeup like in the old days of the old Egyptians like Cleopatra and we modified the uh, application also into a nail polish uh, virtual try on and then it looks like this this is available in the American App Store for the brand Sally Hansen that's the world's largest nail polish uh, brand and you can try on in real time nail polish so no hassle anymore when you have put on the wrong nail polish first try it on with your smartphone yes there is a lot to do about these kind of devices smartphones wearables etc there are a lot of companies in the world who try to convince us we have to wrap our smartphone around our wrist and then it looks like this it starts with one but there are so many of those devices we have the apple watch we have the one of samsung the one of nike etc etc and when this goes on and on and on we will run into a new global problem our arms are not long enough so so there are other brands who uh, create this kind of uh, of devices smart clothing but similar to the watch it's all about the same it's all about me, myself and I. It's all about how many steps I walk, how many miles I run, how many hours I sleep, how many calori calories uh, I eat. So, we and that's not bad, but it's all more or less the same. So we try to do it in a different way. 
and that's this one. This is a project that's about we, us, and society. This is also a wearable. This is a dress that changes its color according to pollution in the air. This is a project we do with a premium luxury brand in Paris. They hand out pieces of clothing to their staff members and their staff members live their lives in and around Paris. Imagine this woman lives in the suburbs of Paris in a green environment. She puts on the dress in the morning and then the dress is white to light gray. When she travels to the city center of Paris, the dress will change to pink and in the end it will be purple. And when she returns home again, it will change back into white and light gray. And what we did is we put some technology in the button that holds the dress together at the back. That button, that technology, uh, measures the data in the dress and transmits the data over the smartphone of that person to the server on the center uh, at the headquarters of that brand. And that brand is now able to plot a map of Paris with clean areas and less clean areas. And last year, there was a smoke alarm in Paris. And there were questions asked in Parliament to the minister. And the minister couldn't answer those questions because he said, dear Parliament, uh, there are about 2,000 boxes in Paris who measure the air quality, but more than 50% of those uh, boxes are broke, so we don't have reliable data. And that brand said, dear minister, we are already doing a project for two years in Paris. We have the data for you. And this is an example how brands can contribute to society because they are looking uh, for ways to give something back because they, make they leave their footprints in society. And this is such a project. <laughs> then something different. This is also a piece of clothing. This is a cape. It's a color-changing cape and it changes its color according to your brain activity. There is a device in the color that scans your brain. And when you are in a happy mood, there will be more yellow and orange in the cape. And when you are sad, down and depressed, it will be more dark blue, brown, and etc. And it looks a little bit like this. We created a video of it. There's someone in the studio with a device in this color. And there are some indicators which will be measured. And then you see slightly changing the colors in the cape. Yes, so I started to talk about wearables, but we think wearables will be uh, a temporary stage. In the end, it all will become embeddables. Digital de devices embedded in your body. This is a guy called Neil Harbison. He calls himself the first human eyeborg. Neil is born with a genetic disorder. He can't see colors. So he created something to see colors. This is a device that is surgically implanted in the back of his skull. He lives with it day and night. And when he looks to a color through that device, the device creates a musical note in the back of his skull. So this guy hears colors. And he's, he's, he's quite special, uh, he's quite into, into uh, creative digital uh, technology. He's also now uh, creating a device that um, generates energy from the pumping of his heart so he doesn't have to charge this device anymore every night while he's asleep. And he's also now recently connected over Wi-Fi to the Internet of Things because he's interested in a lot of data which are available in the world around us and those data are transferred into musical notes and he can identify and read those data by hearing it in the back of his skull. Check him out on, on YouTube or Google. Neil Harbison is his name, quite fascinating. And then another pr project of Embeddables, Project Underskin. 
it's a device which can be implanted in the palm of your hand and it makes you uh, or it enables you to interact with everything you touch you can you're able to open a door by just touching it you are able to exchange data just by shake uh, by uh, shaking someone's hand uh, it can help you that your credit card will only function when you are holding it they are even thinking of uh, displaying uh, images uh, the inside uh, of your hand so quite privately and for your eyes only project on the skin and then we speak a lot on conferences and last year my my colleague was on a conference in the UK and there was a guy who came up to him and said hey you are absolutely right we should get rid of those things wrapped around our wrist it should be embedded and guess what I already started with it and then he showed us his arm he pulled up his sleeve and he showed us this he embedded his smartphone into his arm and then this is the latest this is a file this has been filed for patent a month ago it's the smart lens it's a contact lens with a camera and a display in it so embeddables are really heading towards us and then something slightly different but still relevant this guy is Moritz Waldemeyer I always uh, describe him as the Damien Hurst of light and we started a collaboration with him and I will elaborate on that why but first I will show you a few pieces of his work this is an LED hat which he created uh, for Philip Tracy world's most famous hat maker Philip Tracy is the Karl Lagerfeld of hats this is another hat he created for Philip Tracy well maybe it's a dress this is uh, this uh, is uh, these are the uh, Brazilian performers during the London uh, Olympics during the closing uh, ceremony this is a contemporary Fabergé egg made of made out of metal and LED lights but no wires these are candles but the flame you see is an LED light and this chandelier is now part of the permanent collection of the Metropolitan Museum of Modern Art this is a chandelier in the famous Intercontinental Hotel in Davos in Switzerland where the annual summit is of the world leaders this chandelier uh, beams blue light to the ceiling and white light down and this is Bono of you too and Morris created this laser jacket for Bono and the reason why we no, I have to go back um, the reason why we started the collaboration with this guy there are two as a creative digital agency we want to explore new areas we want to invent new things and when you want to invent something new there are three kinds of people who are able to do that scientists entrepreneurs and artists and Moritz is definitely an artist secondly I showed you before and I told you before digital has to be beautiful and in a lot of work we deliver for our clients we get the feedback it is already very beautiful but for us it's not beautiful enough we are looking for the next level of beauty and therefore we need a collaboration with such an artist and the reason why why we are doing that is we we provide solutions for our clients and we work mainly for retailers for premium luxury retailers and those retailers what they are doing is to try to establish connections with their uh, customers and they are doing that by giving substance to the six E's of shopping the six E's of how to establish of how to tell a brand story to establish a sincere connection with your uh, customers and those six E's are engagement talk to me education teach me something new entertainment keep me interested end use tell me what I can do with it ease make it easy for me and exclusivity and when brands establish to give substance to the six E's of shopping they will um, uh, they will reach higher scores on the new metrics of retail and it's all about ideas per square meter engagement per square meter senses per square meter delight per square meter and smiles per square meter and when you focus on this and when you realize higher scores on these metrics you will ultimately reach a higher score on the old-fashioned 
metrics, which is still sales per square meter. And digital is only a tool, a tool with endless possibilities. And in our vision, the only way to apply digital in, in, in a way that it makes sense is to start with a strategy. From a strategy come goals. And while, try, while, while you're trying to achieve those goals, you will run into issues. And for those issues, you have to create uh, solutions, creative solutions. And then you have to choose the right technology. And brands often start with technology. I want this, I want that, it looks cool. But then it often turns into a gimmick. In our opinion, this is the right order. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, John. Uh, we live in the age of experience, so it's really interesting to see all these examples of brands using this technology to up the experience. There is room for some questions from the audience. Does anyone have a question for John? Yes, the lady in the front. Hi, um, great presentation. I really like um, all the examples you gave. I have a question about the um, color-changing dress uh, in Paris, the pollution one. Um, you wouldn't tell us how you made the dress color change? Yes, I can tell you. It's <laughs> made out of a dye, and the dye is made out of a cabbage. Mm -hmm. And that reacts to the pH degree in the air. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> one question in the back. Here you go. Hi, thank you for your talk. It was very interesting. I was wondering, because you were talking about embeddables as well, what's currently a, a new technology within embeddables that you're most excited about? Mm. Well, uh, personally, I'm not that excited about embeddables, but I think, I think we can't stop it anymore. Uh, I think the something like Project Underskin, which, well, maybe it looks a little bit creepy, but it's not that creepy, but because Keep in mind, uh, there are, are already a lot of embeddable embeddables in the medical industry. Uh, so I think this is something that has nothing to do with, uh, with uh, a medical issue, but it's quite related to those kind of items which people already use for their heart or whatever. So I think those kind of things which are not that uh, drastically, because it's something like a chip in, in your hand, that might be something which is heading towards quite fast. There are already people in the world who chip their kids. <laughs> so Good idea. Mine are over here yeah. somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> I might chip them. <laughs> so thank you very much, John, for this great talk. He's available, so any more questions, just tackle him, and I think he can show you something in his iPad as well. Yeah, if someone wants to try on digital makeup, feel free. <laughs> digital makeup yeah. and everything. Uh, we'll... Uh, we'll it's also a dream for many men. <laughs> <laughs> we'll do a, a quick change and we have a young game designer up next, uh, starting at three. So stick around if you want to hear more. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.